Gospel, Luke chapter 8, and I'm going to be reading from verse 40 to the end of the chapter. Now when Jesus returned, the crowd welcomed him, for they were all waiting for him. And there came a man named Jairus, who was a ruler of the synagogue, and falling at Jesus' feet, he implored him to come to his house. For he had an only daughter, about twelve years of age, and she was dying. As Jesus went, the people pressed around him, and there was a woman who had a discharge of blood for twelve years. And though she had spent all her living on physicians, she could not be healed by anyone. She came up behind him and touched the fringe of his garment, and immediately her discharge of blood ceased. And Jesus said, Who was it that touched me? When all denied it, Peter said, Master, the crowds surround you and are pressing in on you. But Jesus said, Someone touched me, for I perceive that power has gone out from me. And when the woman saw that she was not hidden, she came trembling and falling down before him, declared in the presence of all the people why she had touched him and how she had been immediately healed. And he said to her, Daughter, your faith has made you well. Go in peace. While he was still speaking, someone from the ruler's house came and said, your daughter is dead. Do not trouble the teacher any more. But Jesus, on hearing this, answered him, Do not fear, only believe, and she will be well. And when he came to the house, he allowed no one to enter with him except Peter and John and James and the father and mother of the child. And all were weeping and mourning for her. But he said, Do not weep, for she is not dead, but sleeping. And they laughed at him, knowing that she was dead. But taking her by the hand, he called, saying, Child, arise. And her spirit returned, and she got up at once, and he directed that something should be given her to eat. And her parents were amazed, but, but he charged them to tell no one what had happened. Now sends the reading of God's word. Let's, let's turn to the Lord and ask for his guidance as we open this portion of scripture. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you on this day that we may uh, come to you. Lord, we have uh, questions, we have uh, anxieties in life, we have different needs, and yet we know that in Christ that all things are met and that you are sufficient for all. So we ask that today that as we open this portion of your word that you would reveal to us what you would have us to learn and how we may apply it uh, to our lives that we might live more obediently and faithfully and fruitfully in your sight. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Some of you know that uh, I'm I'm something of an aviation fan. I used to be uh, a, a private pilot years ago. And recently I saw a little story about a a famous aviation event that took place about 13 years ago. I think it was January uh, 2009. And what happened on that particular day was an airliner, a U.S. Airways Airbus, took off from LaGuardia Airport, which is, of course, in New York City, and it it reached about 3,000 feet in about two minutes. And at that moment in time, it ran into a flock of Canada geese. Uh, Canada geese are big birds. Uh, They weigh about six to eight pounds. And that's more, uh, more, that's that's a bird that will will destroy a jet engine. And in fact, uh, at least two birds went into each of these, uh, this, this aircraft's engines on each engine. And so all of a sudden, after a very uneventful takeoff, the pilots, of this airplane, Captain Chelsea Sullenberger and First Officer Jeff Stiles found that they were at 3,000 feet over New York City with no power. And they suddenly had to figure out how they were going to uh, 
set up for some type of landing. And they very quickly, in a very a, a re remarkably short period of time, got the plane configured, got the auxiliary power unit switched on, got it, the aircraft uh, configured for a glide, and in a very short order, uh, Captain Sullenberger, or Sully as he's known, realized there was no way to get back to the airport. There was no way he could glide to Teterboro in New Jersey. The only thing he had open to him was to line up the airplane to come right down onto the Hudson River. And that's what they did. And the plane was able to make a very a gentle touchdown, a ditching operation on the river. And as a result, uh, all 150 passengers and the five flight crew were evacuated without major incident. There were some injuries, but not, not any major instance. And of course, it led the uh, then governor of of New York to call it the miracle on the Hudson, the miracle on the Hudson. Of course, there was a number of things that had to go right. The flight crew had to do their job very well. In God's providence, that particular airplane they were flying was designed to fly over water, so it had large life rafts attached to the emergency doors. And so you may recall that iconic photo of people standing on the wings and in those life rafts. And of course, the crew did a very good job of evacuating the team, and because they landed near Midtown Manhattan, uh, there were lots of vessels that could reach the boat within just minutes to begin to rescue those passengers. It was, it was a really quite a remarkable event, and as I recall reading about some of the passengers on board, they knew that they were going down. They realized the engines aren't making any noise, we're going down, and some of them were even writing notes desperately uh, to their loved ones and tucking it into their pockets in case they didn't survive the impact of the aircraft on the water. It was quite a remarkable, uh, remarkable event. Of course, it was so remarkable that uh, there was a movie made about it with Tom Hanks starring as Sully. Some of you may have even seen that movie uh, many years ago. Well, the news media can make things really interesting and seem very, very remarkable. And this was a remarkable story. But I think uh, we shouldn't lose sight of the fact that the gospel writers want us to see that our Lord also had a remarkable ministry. And we're reading in, in a portion of Luke's gospel where a number of those remarkable incidents do occur. We're not going to look at them in, in detail, but if you just glance back in your, in, your, in your Bibles to earlier in the chapter, there is the... Uh, the uh, episode where Jesus and the disciples are on the sea, and the sea is, uh, is, is riled up by a storm. And the disciples say, Lord, we are going to perish. And so Jesus had to calm the sea. There was a desperation there, uh, probably much like the desperation that the passengers on that airliner experienced. And then there's another uh, remarkable uh, uh, event recorded for for when Jesus goes to the country of the Gerizines, and there is a man there who is possessed with many demons, and he's untamable, and, and you remember the situation, Je Jesus casts out the demons, and those demons go into those pigs, and they run over uh, the hillside in, and are drowned in the lake. And so it was very, very remarkable. In fact, so remarkable that those in that country begged for Jesus to go away. They didn't want that kind of power in their midst. And then today, we're, into, we're going to be looking at two more remarkable uh, accounts uh, involving two women. In fact, I would say they're two daughters. One is a literal daughter of a, of a, a synagogue leader, J. Iris, and the other is a woman who has a discharge of blood. These two um, are... are recorded for us in a kind of interlocking way. Their, their, their stories sort of intrude on each other. Uh, Luke records it that way. Uh, Matthew and Mark also record uh, this incident in very much the same way. So we're going to look at today verses 41 to the end of this chapter as, as, it, as it has to do with these two women. Jesus calls one of them daughter, and of course as the other, as we mentioned, is, an, is a literal daughter. They also have another connection in the number 12, although I don't think there's a lot to be made of it, but the woman had this medical condition for 12 years, and 
the daughter of Jairus is 12 years old. So they, they're just uh, perhaps another way in which their stories are going to overlap and intertwine. Well, I'm going to break uh, our text down into a couple different ways today and under different headings. And our first heading is going to be the, the touch of faith for the six verses that start in verse 43, the touch of faith. And I'm going to be upfront about the fact I've I've benefited from a uh, commentary written by Professor Ralph Davis, who wrote a very readable commentary on the book of Luke, and these are his headings, and I've, I've benefited from some of his insights as well, so I credit him for uh, some of the uh, things that we are going to look at today. The touch of faith. We have in verse uh, 43 the description of this woman who had a, a constant discharge of blood. Uh, most commentators think that this had something to do with her menstrual cycle, and most people think that probably this began when she started first having a, a menstrual cycle. So she's uh, had this problem all of her adult life. Now, you, if you think about what that would mean for us, yes, it, it's perhaps inconvenient, it maybe it's not healthy, but it also has other larger consequences in the in the, in the time in which she's living, because they were living under uh, the, uh, the Old Testament ceremonial law. And in Leviticus 15, if a woman is, uh, is uh, menstruating, she's unclean. If she sits on a couch or a, a chair, and you come and sit on that couch or a chair, you become unclean until, uh, until the evening. In fact, if she touches anyone, uh, that's going to have an impact on, on them as well. So in some ways, she is living a very difficult life. She really can't have a social life. Perhaps she couldn't be married, uh, probably couldn't have children, and in some ways, she would be like a social, a social outcast. In fact, she really shouldn't be in the crowd this day when Jesus is here. And why she is there, probably she's thinking, if I keep a low profile, keep my head down, maybe I can I can sneak in undetected and sneak out. She had some conviction that if she would just go and touch uh, the edge of the garment that Jesus was wearing, his cloak, that this would be uh, it's significant for her. It could lead to some improvement for her. We don't, know how she, we don't know how she came to that conclusion. Luke doesn't really explain that to us, but she has this little bit of faith that somehow coming near Jesus would be beneficial for her. And so we see that um, in verse 44 that she comes up and we read that immediately her discharge of blood ceases. Interesting, by the way, immediately shows up at least two more times in the text we're considering today. Immediately the discharge of blood ceased. She knew at that moment that she was healed. Something had changed in her body. It was very very, very evident for her. And we can imagine that at that moment in time, she may have been rejoicing very quietly internally uh, that this, this circumstance had been corrected. But that little moment of rejoicing uh, doesn't last very long because in the next verse, Jesus turns around and says in verse 45, who was it that touched me? Who was it that touched me? Now, there's a crowd is gathered around Jesus and uh, everybody says, well, I didn't touch you. They all denied it. And uh, eventually Peter comes along with this sort of pragmatic reasoning. Uh, you know, look, Jesus, there's all these people pressing in on you. It could be any number of people. But Jesus says, no. No, somebody has touched me, and the power has gone out from me. That power has gone out from me. Jesus knew that somebody had touched him. So we can imagine the scene here in verse 47, uh, the, uh, the woman th was hoping to slip in, make herself nondescript, and uh, then slip away. But she sees now that that will not be the case. And she comes before uh, Jesus Christ when she says that she could, not, she could not be hidden. And she comes trembling before the Lord. And she falls down before him. Now, why do you think she's trembling? Well, probably because she, she is uh, concerned that Jesus is going to be angry with her, with her is, go, is going to say something 
uh, that will be uh, perhaps show his, his anger against her. Uh, but uh, she goes before him, and notice that in, uh, in this verse she says that in the presence of all the people, she declares why she had touched him and how she had been healed. In a way, that's a confession of what she had done, as well as a testimony of how something had happened. God, God's power had been demonstrated in this case as a testimony of that power. Uh, so uh, there's, this, uh, there's this woman, she's concerned, probably thinking that uh, the Lord Jesus Christ is going to be upset with her, or maybe she's embarrassed, but she's trembling before the Lord. She's made this confession and this testimony. And then we see in verse 48, um, perhaps a, a surprise here to see it this way, how does Jesus respond to her? He says, daughter, daughter. Isn't that interesting? I don't think there's another place in the Gospels where Jesus refers to a woman as daughter. And what a comfort this must have been to this woman to hear this term of, of tenderness and affection uh, as, as the Lord Jesus Christ addresses her. He says, daughter, your faith has made you well. And as you know, it's, notice, it's notable, as we mentioned before, if this woman has had this condition for 12 years, she may be in her mid-20s. She may not be much younger than uh, the Lord Jesus Christ. But he dresses her as daughter, and then he, he emphasizes what made, her, what made her well. It was her faith. Your faith has made you well. In other words, it wasn't, it wasn't a superstitious stroking of a piece of cloth that had brought healing. But Jesus perceived in this woman... Uh, some genuine faith. We don't know what she, how well she knew things or how much it was clear in her own mind, but she had a genuine faith. And she was standing in front of the one in whom she had that faith. And Jesus calls her out. He calls her out of that crowd for the reason that he wants to clarify for this woman, the reason that she's healed is because of her faith. It's not because of something else, not, uh, not because of superstition but it's because of her faith that she has been made well. And then he says, go in peace. And, of course, going in peace here would imply that she's going in a, a way in a relationship that's reconciled to the Lord Jesus Christ. If she, if she has peace with God, then she can be assured that her sins are forgiven and that she has a new life in the Lord just as clearly as she knows that she's been physically healed. So that's why uh, the Lord Jesus Christ could, uh, uh, could, wanted to call her out. Of course, the Lord Jesus Christ calls us out as well. He calls out each one who's not yet come to the Lord, and he calls them to take hold of him uh, by faith. Uh, he calls each one of us to have that touch of faith as well, and to rely entirely on him for our salvation and on nothing else. So that is the, the touch of faith of, of this uh, daughter who had this uh, a bleeding condition. But what about Jairus? Uh, so that leads us to our next uh, heading, which is the trial of faith. If we had the touch of faith, now we have the trial of faith, which we see in verses 41 and 42 and then 49 to the end of the chapter. Um, Jairus, remember, was a ruler of the synagogue. He was waiting for Jesus. He knew that Jesus could help him with his need. He had, he had a daughter, his only daughter, at home, and she was sick. And he knew that Jesus could do something to help her. And so he, he falls at Jesus' feet. He's contrite in verse 41, and he implores him to come to his house. Uh, so uh, Jesus is, is, uh, is going to be on his way to uh, J. Iris's home, but now this other problem came, came up. And isn't that interesting? And in, um, uh, in, in the providence of God, that affects uh, God's servants again and again. How to decide if, if two things come up, what do we do? How do we, how do we proceed? You know, these are medical situations. Years ago, there were probably, if you, country doctors would get a call that uh, Mr. Smith needed the doctor, and then he gets another call, and Mrs. Jones is delivering a baby. What does the doctor do? How do you, how do you prioritize? in those situations. 
Um, and then for J. Iris, he imagined what the dilemma he has in his mind. He is a father of, a, of his only daughter, and he's looking at the, perhaps the prospect if they don't get to his home quickly enough, she will die. And he would then have to bury his daughter. That uh, doesn't, doesn't, never seems right for a parent to have to bury a child or to bury a grandchild. Uh, last summer, my wife and I and, and uh, my brother and a cousin were touring around uh, the area of St. Louis where I was born in St. Louis, Missouri. And we were going to some uh, cemeteries in St. Louis and, and Illinois where some of my relatives are buried to just to try to build in and understand what our family tree really is. And I remember going to one of these cemeteries in Illinois and we found our relatives. But on the next row, there were some tombstones, but then there were arranged in front of one of those tombstones a number of little tombstones, five or six little ones that were only about six inches wide and maybe six inches tall. And when I looked at them carefully, they each had the name of a child who had lived maybe six months or a year or maybe two years. Uh, these children had been born maybe 150 years ago, and they had not lived very long. And I was thinking, what a heartbreak uh, that uh, those parents must have had to bury so many children in one spot. They may have had other children that grew, but they, uh, these uh, five or six uh, did not see even the age of three or four. They may never have been able to even walk. And so that what, a, what a sadness that is for a parent. Some of us have, have had that experience, and we know what it's, what it's like to lose a child. And so we can imagine for, for Jairus uh, that this was a, an urgent situation for him. There wasn't much time. And in fact, he's, we don't know what uh, he's thinking. Luke doesn't record for us, but you can imagine him thinking as Jesus speaks with the bleeding woman, uh, can't we get going? We need to move. We can't wait. There's an urgency. Time is of the essence. Um, and of course, this is not helped at all by the fact that in verse 49, as Jesus is speaking uh, to the, the bleeding woman, that someone comes from the ruler's house and announces that your daughter is dead. Do not trouble the teacher anymore. So it seems like uh, we've gone from it being an urgent matter to now being a matter of fact that the, the girl is, is dead. But notice what Jesus says in the ne next verse. Jesus, on hearing this, answered him, Do not fear, only believe, she will be well. See, he was telling uh, Jairus, uh, you need to still believe, only believe. It's not much to hold on to, you might think, but um, that's what he, he's, he's telling uh, Jairus. Now, we, we know that as we go on here, that Jesus is going to raise this girl. And this is not the first time that Jesus has raised someone from the dead. Uh, uh, in uh, chapter 7 of Luke's gospel, Jesus goes to the town of Nain, and he encounters a widow. Her only son is on the way to be buried. He has died, and Jesus raises that only son. Of course, Jesus is going to raise Lazarus, and, as it's recorded for us in John 11. But in each of these cases, this is not the final resurrection. Certainly these are raised to life again, but they'll live and they will die again. Perhaps this girl would, would go on to bury her own parents. Uh, but uh, it is not the final resurrection. Uh, but the same power is at work here. But Jesus is demonstrating through this that he has power over death. And in some ways, he's showing us what the final resurrection is going to be like on the day when he returns and he raises all of his people to everlasting life. In a way, this is pointing even to the future resurrection. Well, uh, Jesus goes to the home, and you'll notice that he takes um, only three of his closest disciples and the girl's parents into the room with him. I mean, why, why does he take the disciples? And I think we can only say that it is so that they would be a witness of what takes place. Luke, in his gospel, says he's spoken to eyewitnesses. Of course, Peter, James, and John would be those eyewitnesses of this particular case. But he tells the parents in verse 56, he tells them to tell no one what had happened. Now, why is that? 
you know, the, everyone knows that the girl has died, and pretty soon they're going to see the girls outside playing around, eating her meals, and, and uh, engaging a, and, uh, again in life. They're going to know that she's come back to life. Why does Jesus tell the parents not to tell anyone what had happened? Well, I think it's probably because, as you notice, the attitude of those that are around, it's not an attitude of belief. First of all, some of them say, send the teacher away. There's no need for him to stay. And others are laughing at him and mocking him. They're saying, you know, there's nothing he can do. I think in, in, in the case of the crowd, they were not granted the privilege of seeing uh, the, the work of the Lord when Jesus Christ took the hand of that little girl. Uh, it's as if he's reaching across the threshold of death and raising her back to life again. What a m remarkable thing that would be. I, I imagine that some who were there would see in, in a mini way the glory of God at work. But those that mocked the Lord did not have uh, the privilege to come and see this. But in doing this, Jesus is teaching us that he has, uh, he, that he is, has power over death. He has the keys of death and of Hades. He's the King of kings and the Lord of lords. And this should give us hope in our trials of faith. Certainly this was a trial of faith for Jairus, but the Lord will also put us into our own trials, and we should, re as we look upon this, we ought to remember that this should give us hope when God places us in trials as well. Well, finally, that brings us to the, the final main point I'd like to make, and that's the teaching of faith. We looked at the touch of faith, the trial of faith, and the teaching of faith. What can we learn about faith from this passage? How can we apply it to our lives? Because I think there's a couple of applications that we can make from this uh, briefly. The first is that Jesus can seem to be most severe when he is helping us the most. He can seem most severe when he is doing us much good and helping us. Take, the, take the, the, the bleeding woman, for example. She thought Jesus was going to be angry with him. She was, came trembling before him. But in fact, Jesus did, in fact, not act in that way, but he was gracious toward her. He was compassionate, he, and he wanted to clarify what her faith is. What had healed her was her faith, not some superstitious stroking of cloth. He wanted her to have an assurance as well that she was at peace with the Lord. And for Jairus, uh, Jesus' delay, of course, uh, was, would have been much uh, of stress for him. Uh, he perhaps was very disappointed when he first heard that his, his daughter had, had died. But Jesus told him to cling to the idea that he should believe, only believe. So in each of these circumstances, it might seem that G the way Jesus is dealing with us is more severe than it may have an appearance of, se of severity, but in fact, Jesus is preparing to do much good on our behalf. It reminds me of a, of a phrase in, uh, in, our, in our hymnal, in William Cooper's hymn, uh, God Moves in a Mysterious Way, it's hymn number 128. There's a phrase, I think it's in the fourth stanza, which reads, behind a frowning providence, he hides a smiling face. So Jesus can see most severe when he is doing us much good. And the second thing I think we can learn from this is that Jesus always leads us in such a way to reveal more of himself to us. Jesus is always leading us in such a way as to reveal more of himself to us. And I think in the way we can see this is with Jairus. Jairus approaches Jesus with faith in the first verses of this passage. He's contrite. He knows Jesus. He knows that Jesus can heal. And so he's very, uh, he's, he, he's, he has a confidence in going to the Lord. But when we get to verse 49 and verse 50, Jesus is really saying to Jairus, um, you are going to have to have a deeper and a higher faith at this moment in time, as, as he knows that his daughter has died. Uh, he was convinced that Jesus could heal uh, the, the, the girl, but is he now convinced that Jesus can do something even more? Uh, it's as if Jesus is saying to him in verse 50, 
You trusted me for what is urgent. Are you now willing to trust me for something that seems irreversible? You trusted me for something that is alarming, but are you willing to trust me for something that now seems hopeless? Am I, Jesus is saying to, to Jairus, am I adequate for this situation? I was adequate adequate for the one, but am I adequate now for, for this one? Of course, this is certainly something that the Lord revealed to Jairus in healing his daughter, and the Lord reveals that to us as well, whether it's you or me or Jairus. Through his leading, he reveals more of himself to us. He wants us to have a greater faith applied in our lives. Jesus is always more than we really can imagine. Uh, we can always trust in uh, the Lord Jesus Christ in our desperation. Uh, do, you, do you believe that? We can also trust him even in our death. And in his severity, he brings comfort. And in his delays, he, he, he gives us hope. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you that we may, Lord, meditate upon this passage today. We ask that you give to us the same confession and profession that this woman had, and that you would enable us to follow the lead of our dear Savior. We thank you for his tender mercies. We thank you that you've given us your spirit to be the guide of all our lives. We pray that we would trust you in all things, and you would grant us a heavenly peace and comfort. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.